Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you this morning. Amen. I woke up this morning, got out, stood on the front porch and let out a dove. It, it didn't return, so I figured it's safe to go to church. It found a place to, to land. So I guess y'all let your doves out this morning, found a place to come to church too. By the way, we did get a little water in the church here. It mostly looked like Lake Believers around here for most of the week. Uh, we got some water in our nursery areas over here. And uh, what I need is some volunteers who could come by early this week. I got the little three-year-old room and that closet there and the storage closet. I'd like to take out about four feet up sheetrock. And uh, so if you can kind of come by this week and do that, pull that out, let's sanitize it. And then a couple of days later, like come back in and put some sheetrock back in. It probably won't take but about four sheets of sheetrock maximum to do it, if that much. It's just a small area, but we need to get it out of there, get the black mold out of there. We don't want that going with the kids and stuff. Amen? So that means don't just say amen uh, right after service. You can help with that sometime this week. Get a hold of Matthew. Let him know you want to help with that. And uh, then we'll get it back in and get it back up and taped and floated and painted. But I uh, want to get that area cleaned out. When you come down the hallway, you can, you can even smell it if you've if you got a good nose. Amen? We're going to preach a message tonight. One more night with the frogs today. And I shared this message back in 1902, I think. <laughs> it's been a while ago. I've, I've been working on messages for the last four or five weeks. That I'll be preaching in Belize. And this is one of those. And I felt with all the rain we've had, this would certainly be appropriate for today. I've never seen so many frogs in my yard. I don't know about yours. It sounds like a chorus when you walk out the door. Uh, I like to have a heart attack the other day after one of those big showers came through with all the winds. That first week we had all this going on and I have a pool back there and went out and pulled one of the skimmers up and was walking away to dump all the trash out of the skimmer and it exploded in my hands. Out came this seven foot frog. <laughs> Looked like it at the moment, okay? <laughs> he made a mess. I almost made a mess. You're just not expecting stuff like that. It just explodes in your face and boom, there's this ugly frog. You know, we could have been eating frog legs for a week if I'd have caught him, but he got away fast. But he, he got away out of there too quick. But uh, I don't know about you, but I'm glad to see the sunshine today and hopefully these rains will just be spotty and then be on their way. Can I get a witness to that? Amen. Amen. We do have some people that didn't get water in the house. Continue to pray for them. Uh, you know, my brother's not here today with his wife. They live down in the, in the Brazos River Bend area. And uh, their property was completely flooded for the last two weeks. His house stayed dry, praise the Lord. He just can't get to it. And uh, so uh, there'll probably be another few more days before they can get in there to get, to get to their house. But they did have people, one guy who stayed down there and canoe down to his house regularly to check it out for him. So, uh, but we had like Margaret Nicole got some water in her house and uh, others that have, that have had to deal with that. So pray for our friends, family, help when you can. And we try to be helpful with funds in those regards if people are experiencing those kind of problems. It's always a reminder that, you know, it never hurts to put a little more in the offering plate, folks, because it does go to help people. So let's, let's be cognizant of that and ministering to people. Hallelujah. Let's have church. Open your Bibles if you want to. I'll have it on the screen if you're that lazy. Oh, the day of modern day privileges. All right. One more night with the frogs picks up in the second of the 10 plagues upon Egypt. You remember the story, Moses, the burning bush? You got that? You hadn't read the story. Some of you saw the movie. But anyway, he's at the burning bush. Uh, God speaks to him. He goes to tell Pharaoh, let his people go. And Pharaoh refuses. And upon Pharaoh's refusal, then the river Nile is turned into blood. When he refuses to let the people go then, then you deal with this second plague. Let's pick up the story in scripture in Exodus chapter eight. And the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs and the Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come up and go into your house and into your bedroom and in your bed and into the house of your servants and on your people and into your ovens, into your kneading troughs and the kneading bowls. The bread's made, all right? So the frogs will come upon you and your people and all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams, over the pools, and make frogs come upon the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did the same with their secret arts. 
making more frogs come upon the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Aaron and for Moses and Aaron and said, entreat the Lord that he may remove the frogs from me and from my people. I will let the people go that they may sacrifice the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, the honor is yours. Tell me when shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs may be destroyed from your houses and you and they may be left only in the Nile. And Pharaoh gave this classic answer, tomorrow. May it be according to your word, said Moses, that you may know that there's no one like the Lord our God and the frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people and they'll be left only in the Nile. But that's tomorrow. I don't know if you're aware of it, you know, this week we had National uh, Donut Day. Y'all familiar with that one, right? Uh, back in April, we had, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent, and I, and I didn't get to celebrate that day. I was working. So uh, this week, sometime I'm going to make up for that and show my, 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 uh, my honors to the donut people. <laughs> but you may not realize, but back in April, there was a U.S. also National Day, and it was National Frog Day, where a day in which we should all show our love and respect to the frogs. I don't plan on keeping that one or following up with it, all right? But uh, we get to show our love for the frogs. The land of Egypt, on the other hand, they were frog lovers. In spite of probably being the cleanest sanitary culture in that time in history, they were very big on staying clean. They worshiped frogs. If you follow the story here, you see that God deals with Egypt and each of these plagues with a frontal assault attack upon the gods of Israel. Nile was revered as a God. Frogs were revered as God. And these plagues that God brought upon them, each one was unique. There were, there were plagues of flies and locusts and gnats. I mean, you could say that God just bugged them to death, you know? Y'all know why frogs are so happy all the time, don't you? They just eat what bugs them. Okay, okay, it wasn't funny, but it's all right. In fact, they're one of the goddesses of, is, of Egypt was the goddess of, called Hecate. She had the form of a woman with the frog of a head. So here she is sporting this beautiful body and this lovely face. She bore a frog's head. And she was worshipped and revered as a goddess. She was the goddess of fertility. She was the goddess who watched over the midwives. She was the son of Ra, the sun god. She was the daughter of Ra. And she was married to a particular God as well. And this particular God is, uh, is her husband. And I forgot his name, but he was the God who was in charge of uh, making you and me on, on the potter's wheel. And this frog goddess, and her name was Hecate, that when he would finish making someone on his potter's wheel, he would place the infant into the womb of the, 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 of the woman. And then she would breathe out of her nostrils life upon these babies that would be placed into the womb. She was worshiped, she was revered. She was considered the goddess of fertility and people respect. In fact, it was against the law to kill frogs in Egypt. You couldn't kill frogs. And it's interesting that as God curses and plagues these people in the way that he does it, not only is it terribly discomforting and miserable for their lives, but it's also a clear picture of the weakness the frailty and the inability of their own gods to deliver them from any problem. They probably wish they only had a national frog day because here they were having frog week and they weren't going along with it very well. In fact, if you read the story, the scripture is pretty clear as you look at all these frogs, these so-called sacred animals, that they begin to multiply. In fact, the Hebrew word for frog here doesn't show itself in the plural. It shows itself only in the singular. In other words, there was just so many frogs, you just look at and all you see was frog. That's the way it was put. It was a plague of frog. Everywhere you look, frog. If you read the story, there were frogs. It says they, they would come upon your house. So they would come upon you. I mean, can you imagine walking around having to knock frogs off you as you're going through your day? Can you imagine just frogs everywhere? It said they will come into your kitchens frogs. You go to the kitchen cabinet, you open it up, you want to get a saucer, you pull it out, there's a frog. You get a coffee cup out of the countertop, you pull it out, you look in it to fill up the coffee, there's a frog. It says not only were they in the cabinets and all the utensils, scripture says they were everywhere in the house that they would also be in the kneading troughs. What's that? That's where they would, you know, take the grain and mix it with the water and make flour and, the, and, and create the, with the flour and the water, they'd make the bread and they would knead it out. 
So as they would be kneading the, the, the dough and working out the lumps of, there would be some unique lumps in the dough. And as you peeled it back, guess who's smiling at you? A frog. You go sit in your most comfortable chair. Croak. Frogs. You, you get into bed. The Bible says that they were in their beds and on their beds. Can you imagine going to bed and sleeping with frogs? Now, Kathy has to do that every night with me, but other than that, frogs. You pull back the bank, blankets. Frogs. Not one, not some, but a bunch. You put on your shoes. Frogs. You put on your pants. Frogs. You put on your dress. There's frogs. They're everywhere. They're in the closets. You can't escape them no matter where you go. You know, if the chariots and the horses are going down the streets, what are they doing? They're running over frogs. There's frog guts and frog blood and frog smell and frog stench and frog death everywhere you turn. You don't even like the love bugs when they infiltrate Texas. Can you imagine scraping the frogs off your bumpers? Your windshield wipers aren't big enough to handle the frogs. And this is the story. It is a plague of frogs. They're everywhere. They're loathsome. They're tormenting. They're in the bread. Once the bread is done, you cut the loaf. There's some nice little protein supplements in the bread called frogs. <laughs> They're everywhere you look. You can't escape them. And it says that the people became weary because they were so loathsome. And now this divine symbol becomes a symbol of a curse to them. And everywhere they look, they're made up of frogs. What's God doing? He's making them sick of the goddess of Hecate, all right? And this frog goddess, and he's making them sick of the way they're living. Here's the unique thing about it, is you follow the address that's given to Pharaoh by Moses, he makes it very clear to him that they're not just gonna come upon your people and your servants, they're gonna come into your house and they're gonna be in your kneading trough and they're gonna be in your oven and they're gonna be in your furniture. You're gonna have to deal with the frogs as well. Well, that's another deal. Usually if you're royalty and you have the money and you have the wealth, you have the palace, you can deal with those kind of things. But everybody's getting the frogs. In fact, it was Queen Victoria who in her Dublin castle, when she went to stay there, it was surrounded with squalor and poverty everywhere she looked. So what she did being having royal privilege, she just built walls higher so she wouldn't have to look at all the poverty. That's the way some people try to react to the situation. It just changed some things. Moses made it clear, hey, the frogs are going to come upon you. I mean, let's, let's think about the reality of this moment. You don't read this like a fable. This is a fact. Can you imagine the tremendous emotional problems that this began to cause? Can you imagine the economic chaos that it, that it began to cause? God sends frogs everywhere you go, frogs. Not wolves, not bears, not monsters, not an army, just frogs. So as the story goes, Pharaoh's sick of the frogs. The people are sick of the frogs. Everywhere you go, you know his wife is sick of the frogs. And if mama ain't happy, he ain't happy, right? So there's frogs that have to be dealt with. So he calls for Aaron and he calls for Moses and he says, all right, let's get rid of the frogs. I'll let you go and worship the Lord your God. Moses said, oh, I'll give you the honors. Whom would you like to get rid of the frogs? And the answer was, how stupid can you be? What was wrong with yesterday? Frog's gone right now. I mean, what's up with this answer? What's going through his mind? And I, I, we have to realize some things about it. when we begin to reason and we're apart from under, and having wisdom and godly direction and godly mind and godly understanding, then, the, then we're capable of all kinds of stupid answers. What's up with this delay? What's, what's up with the procrastination? That, that's the way people handle their problems though. That's the way some of you today might be handling your problems. Every time I've dealt with my problems like that, it's never worked. In fact, there's about, there's about three or four ways you can deal with crisis issues in your life. Let me give you, give you three or four real quick. First is, is, is Pharaoh's way. It, we call it the delayed way. The delayed way just says, you know, do it tomorrow. You know, we'll take care of it tomorrow. It's manana. It's not today. Uh, understand this though. If your mind is separated from the mind of God and the wisdom of God and the understanding of who God is and what God's done for you in your life, then you don't know how to think properly. In fact, this is seen throughout all of the New Testament that people who don't know God, who don't surrender life to God, do really not have a, 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 an ability to think sensibly. But look at the culture we live in today. We're, we're too busy being politically correct and just to go by pure, simple, common sense. We've disregarded common sense. There's nothing common about common sense anymore. It used to be common. It's not so common anymore. I mean, after all the misery, 
after all the suffering, after all the hardships, after all the pain that these people have been seizing, seeing after all, I mean, can you imagine just the health issue it created? They say tomorrow. But there's a lot of people no different from Pharaoh in the world we live in. There's a lot of people who use the same kind of understanding. We get circumstances, we have situations that come into our lives. We have problems that are plaguing us. We got a crisis in our marriage, our home, whatever it might be. And how do we deal with it? We just, we just delay it. We don't want to face it. T tomorrow, you know, I'll start working on my, my drug problem. Tomorrow, I'll start working on my drinking problems. Tomorrow, I'm going to deal with that, the issue of debt in my life. Tomorrow, I, I'm going to, I'm going to oh, here's my favorite. I'm going to start my diet tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow, I'll quit smoking. Tomorrow, I'll stop nagging my husband. Tomorrow, I'll be, a better, uh, I'll be a better husband to my wife. I'll treat her better. Tomorrow, I'll finish that homework assignment. Tomorrow, I'll fix that thing in the house. Tomorrow, I'll look for a job. Tomorrow, I'll make that phone call. Tomorrow, I might even give my life to God. It's always tomorrow. I once read it talking about procrastination. Procrastination is like a credit card. It's a whole lot of fun until you get the bill. And the bills come and the bill is due. The things in our lives that give us most of the problems, why is it those are the things we hold on to the most? They're creating such a crisis, they're creating such a dilemma in our life, but yet we just don't get rid of them, we don't deal with it, we don't do what needs to be done. What's the problem? I get back to what I said, I think the problem is we've lost the ability to reason. We've lost the ability to think correctly. We go by what feels good or what's gonna make me feel better or the easy way. It's what you might call this age today, the age of insanity. We're living in an age where, you know, close to 2,000 Americans have nervous breakdowns every day. We're living in a day that if you wanna make a quick billion dollars, just come up with some kind of new, uh, new, new pill that, that makes people feel better. We're living in a day of, of a drug crisis. I watch the, the news and the media now take a whole new interest in the, the opiate addiction in America, which is millions upon millions of people. Everybody's addicted to some kind of painkiller or a Vicodin or some kind of something that's coming across through the pharmacy. So since the death of Prince and his opiate overdose, now we're saying that, hey, well, we probably ought to pay more attention to this in America. Hey, for the last three decades, doctors have been handing out painkillers like they were M&Ms. And we have a whole culture now that is strung out on these things. Uh, I, they were kind of covering this in the news and millions of Americans who have opiate addictions and they were, they were looking at some of these clinics, you know, these doctors who just have clinics so they can write prescriptions and charge you an office bill for it. And they went to West Virginia and there, there was probably 300 people standing out this side this one clinic to get their prescriptions for opiates. We're living in a, in a drug induced culture seems that everybody's taking something for something. Mama's little helpers. Why is it? Because it's just easier. It helps me delay doing something about it. It helps me put something off. It helps me from having to face my issue. I mean, it's, it's really, for lack of better terminology, it's just madness. Madness. We've lost our capacity to, to reason. The Bible says in more than one place, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we should be sober, be vigilant, your adversary, the devil, walks about as a, boor, or as a roaring lion. He's boring too, but he's roaring. As a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he says, so you be sober and to be vigilant, be on guard. The word sober there, it doesn't necessarily mean be free from alcohol and drugs, which that's really obviously what it means. But it's a much deeper and broader meaning. To be sober means to learn how to think correctly. It's made up of two Greek words. Friend is the word for mind, which we get for knowledge and words like that. And sof, S-O-P-H, it's sof, friend, and it literally means to be safe-minded, to think safely, to think rightly, to think properly, to think righteously. But we don't, we don't live in that kind of world anymore. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I sit in front of the, the news sometimes and think, well, well, that's just ludicrous, that's just stupid, that's just mindless, that's just senseless. We wonder what's going on in the culture. It's, it, it, we see the, the, the effects of it. It really gets down to this issue where we've rejected the right way of thinking, which is God's word and God's standards and the moral issues. And when God lays out something, we, we've rejected that because we don't like that or we don't want that or we like something else or something else feels better or we prefer something. But what God says is what God says, but we don't want to hear what God says. Hey, that's madness. For us to reject God, it's like a spiritual suicide. So when God deals with us about our problems nationally, 
When God deals with us about our problems globally or even personally, what do we do? We just say, I don't want to deal with it right now. Maybe tomorrow. Now, the second way is about the same thing. It's the, it's the no way way. Ain't no way I'm doing this. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to deal with it. I'd rather spend one more night with the frogs because if I spend one more night with the frogs, maybe they'll just go away of their own. So I'll just ignore God. I'll ignore his word. I don't want to hear what God says. I'll pretend that there is no God. Isn't it amazing how many people believe that there is no God, spend most of their life trying to prove that? I mean, they, they're so bitter against God and hate so, God so much, they do everything they can to prove that he doesn't exist. <laughs> it's no way. I don't want to do anything. I refuse to do anything. I can handle this myself. I'm man enough. I'm woman enough. I'm strong enough. You know, and they just go about their own life doing whatever they want to do. Act like God is dead. Screaming and fighting and running the whole way. And then the, the third way is this, is, is my way, which these all are pretty much interwoven. It's the, I can handle this. I will take care of this. Hey, Pharaoh's thinking about, hey, I've got some magicians. Okay, can you see the look on his face when that, that first day or two, he's so sick of it, he calls the magicians, he says, guys, solve this problem. And they go out and do their little incantation and they just multiply the problem. <laughs> says they went out and caused more frogs to come upon the land. That's what usually happens when we try to handle things our own way. It just multiplies the problem. There is a way in Proverbs, it says, there is a way that seems right unto man, but it's not, it's death. And so we deal with these things in our own little way. It's my way. This is the way I want to handle it. You know, I, I, I'm not going to ask for help. I'm not going to ask for God. I'm not going to need anybody. I don't need anything else. I'm going to do it. The fourth way, well, we just call it the right way. This is the way we should deal with our problems. It's, it's the solution. It's listening to God. It's hearing what God desires. It's responding to God's request. It's hearing what he has to say to us and not ignoring God. The real key to personal revival, our personal salvation, our national revival, national salvation, is for people to respond to God in the way that he calls them to respond to him with repentance and faith and humility. That's your answer, not procrastination. Not putting it off, not saying, well, tomorrow I'm going to deal with that. Tomorrow I'm going to fix that situation. Tomorrow I'm going to fix my relationship with my parents. Tomorrow, No, that's not going to work. You have got to go back to the book, to the word, to thus saith the Lord, and see what does he say about your situation, about your frogs. And you deal with your frogs in the way that God tells you to, to deal with them. But people, they don't want to do that. People say, well, if I do that, Pastor, people think I'm crazy. Well, you think you're crazy already, so what's the matter? If I do that, I mean, it might hinder my, my reputation. Well, you haven't got much of a reputation. If it doesn't include God, if it doesn't include humility. I mean, look at how they treated Moses. He has to be a madman. He's coming in here with his big stick, waving it around, and his brother making all these demands. They're out of their mind. You tell me as you follow the story through, who was out of their mind? You look at Paul as he stands before Felix and before Festus, the kings uh, in, in the scriptures in the New Testament times. And they say to him, oh, Paul, much learning has made you mad. You're a genius, but you've gone over the edge. That's what the world still says today. Who was it Felix that says, I'll hear you tomorrow. We'll talk about this later. We'll deal with this at another time, but not today. Why? Because he's mad. Nero. Most insane leader of Rome that probably had ever lived, and most of them were. He ends up burning Rome down to the ground. He, he's the one who accuses Paul of being foolish and stupid and being a fool. Paul wore the, wore the badge proudly. I am a fool for Christ. I don't mind being called that. According to the world, that means I'm really wise with God. You ever thought about, you know, how many people name their children Nero versus how many of them name them Paul? <laughs> Because who was the fool? Who was the madman? Who was the crazy? It wasn't the apostle and it wasn't the Lord Jesus who they said was mad. It's who's the mad? The mad ones are the ones who say, well, you know, I don't want to deal with this today. I'm just going to deal with it some of the day, but not today. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe I won't have to get right with God. You know, maybe if I just go to church, that's good enough. If I just sit in the pew, you know, hey, the only hope 
of dealing with the plague of frogs that enter our lives on so many different levels is, is just simple repentance before God saying, I want to get my heart right with God and follow Jesus and commit my life to him and love him with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, body and strength. I want to love God. If we don't come to that place, all right, if we, if we don't move away from the delayed way, the no way, the my way to get to the right way, which is God's way, then there's really not much hope for us. But even more than that, there's a tremendous risk that you're taking with your life, with your family even, because none of us lives in isolation. The way I live my life affects all those people around me, all right, or infects them. But we need to be a righteous effect upon people's lives. Say, well, what's the big deal if I put this off? Let me give you four reasons why you shouldn't put it off. We'll call it the risk of neglect. And, and it works like this. If you follow the scriptures through, it says that if we choose not to hear God, then we are making a serious bad decision. If you choose to say, maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ Jesus personally. If you put this off today, you're making a very bad decision. Maybe you're here as a believer. And you're thinking, you know, I, I, I know I, I know the Lord, but I really don't want to get rid of these things in my life. Maybe one more day, maybe tomorrow, but not, not that I don't want to get. Hey, you're making a bad, bad choice for your life. You're making a terrible decision. Let me, let me give you four things that will happen. One is the risk of the second coming of Jesus. You don't, want to, you don't want to be there when Jesus appears as a believer and be so ashamed because of the way you've been living your life. And you certainly don't want to be when Jesus comes and, and, and appears in the sky and takes the church away and the tribulation means you don't want to be that guy without Jesus. All right. You don't want to be him because you have no hope. Well, I'll get saved in the tribulation. No, you won't. Because Paul teaches and he writes to the Thessalonians, he says, listen, for all you people who just playing games and you won't listen to God and you won't obey God's word. All right. You've ignored what God said because you loved your pleasure when you love God. He says in the end times, God's going to send a strong delusion and you're going to be deceived and you'll believe the lies of the Antichrist. That's a pretty powerful statement. Because a lot of people think, well, I just put this off, put this off tribulation. I might get saved. And you say, who thinks that? I've talked to people like that, which shows you the insanity of the way our brains can go. All right. And the madness of living our life. But I'll mark this down. Jesus is coming again. Amen. I mean, we just say it again. <laughs> you might think I'm mad. Jesus could come today. Amen. I really believe that. You know, if you, if you study scripture and you see Jesus' first coming, born as a babe in Bethlehem, that was all prophesied. That was prophesied for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before it ever happened. Multiple prophecies were written about the first coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who would give his life, the one who would, who would be wounded and beaten and stricken and smitten for our sins on our behalf. Isaiah, Daniel, others wrote, the prophets wrote about him. From the, from the very first book of, in Genesis, God spoke about him, that he would come to bruise the serpent's head, right? That's all about a, a, a savior who would come. Guess what? He came. But even during that time when he came, there were those who ignored it. You remember the, 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 the kingmakers from the east who came, followed the star, and they came to Jerusalem. And they stopped in at Jerusalem because that was the center of religion. So if Messiah is coming, if anybody knows where he is, where he's going to be born, what's going on, these guys are going to know. So they stop in there and confer with Herod. Herod says, hey, I've heard something about that. Before. Let me call, let me call in the, come, come call in the preachers. So they call them the scribes and the Pharisees and they come and say, oh yeah, 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 that's true, that's a prophecy and he's gonna be born in Bethlehem. I'm sure that as those men of wisdom got on their animals and made their way to Bethlehem, looked over their shoulder, they were expecting all of Jerusalem to be following because we've seen his sign. God's told us that he's coming, that he's gonna be born and we wanna be there for the birth. You'd think there'd be a whole line of preachers following of scribes and Pharisees and theologians. Not a one. It, I believe that the Bible says as it was then, it's gonna be now. I believe that when Jesus comes, you know, that hour we, he says that, that you better be ready because when people aren't think, thinking he's gonna come at all, that's when he's gonna come. We're living in that kind of generation now more than ever. We're living in a time when people are ignoring the facts. All those prophecies concerning Jesus and his first coming were fulfilled. There are three or four times as many prophecies about his second coming as there are his first coming. 
One in every eight verses of the New Testament is given over to some element of prophesying the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, all that needs to happen now after all these prophecies that have to be fulfilled before him to come, let me just put it this way. There's nothing else that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church, the taking away. No other prophecies, all right? Everything needs to be done. I mean, from, from the, 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 the unions of, of the European to the Russian situation, to the, to the Jewish situation, to the establishment of a Jewish state, to the Palestinian situation, the Arab world, you know, all the conflicts, all, all, all this terrorism, it's all prophesied. It's all prophesied. And never in the world, at any time in history, has the world stage been set so properly and, and, and so in line with scripture than it is today? No other time in history. Add to that the establishment, which was probably the number one thing when Jesus referred to Matthew 24, to the fig tree, which was the establishment of the Jewish nation. No other time in history. But now, when that prophecy was given in Matthew 24, Israel wasn't even a nation anymore and wouldn't be a nation until 1948. That's a long time to go by, isn't it? But Jesus said, when you see the fig tree boom, you know that my coming is near. In fact, he says, I'm at the door. I'm at the door. What happens when you get the door? The next thing is the knock. <laughs> That's when Jesus calls those people who truly know him, his children, up to meet him in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then those that are alive, they love Jesus, they'll meet him in the air. Then we go into heaven for a seven year period where there's, the, there's the, 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 the judgment seat of Christ where we receive rewards or loss of rewards. There's a time of, and a season of great praise. There's a lot that goes on in heaven. Seven years while back on the earth, all hell's breaking loose. God is doing a work in the, in the world that the whole world turns upside down and then becomes against Israel and then ultimately the whole world turns against God. And in their ignorance think they can do something about it. And then comes the second coming, all right, of Jesus Christ. All, all that needs to be done, we'll talk about this more later on in the year. But all that needs to be done, you understand, has already been done. The next thing on God's prophetic calendar, so to say, the next event, today's things to do, oh, the rapture. Go get my kids. Bring them to the house, it's ready. Bring, it's, it's time for the reunion. It's time for the marriage feast. Bring them home. And he comes. Oh, Pastor, I don't believe that. You will. <laughs> you show up at church one Sunday. Amen. I'm not here. I would say probably 90% aren't here. All right. And it didn't even flood. <laughs> but something happened in the sky. Hallelujah. Gone. It's, it's that, in that moment, it's too late. It's too late. The only people to be saved during the tribulation, according to the scriptures, are people who, who really didn't understand or comprehend what the gospel was or what it was really all about. We have a lot of people who are going to show up on church on Sunday, I believe, in a lot of churches across this nation because they never made a personal decision for Jesus Christ in their own heart and life. Don't, don't risk that moment in history and time because it's going to happen. Jesus Christ is going to come. There's the second risk that you face. It's, it's the risk what we call sudden death. All right? Well, but nobody wants to think about that. Hebrews 9, 27 says it's appointed a man wants to die. And after this, you face God. It's a judgment. There, there's a lot of people who are going to die today who are not expecting it. There's thousands of people across the globe going to die today that just weren't expecting. Nobody told me I was going to die today. Excuse me. I got plans. I got things to take care of. I got family to take care of. No, I'm sorry. You're dead. No, you, I can't be dead, but you're dead. I didn't think I was going to die. So I'm sorry. You're still going to die. Does anybody here know when they're going to die? Please raise your hand. You know when you're going to die? Can you give me the date? No. But let me tell you, that, it could be today. All right? It could be today. There's no, there's, there's, there's just no explanation. It happens all the time. Young, old, infant, adult, senior citizen, teenager. People are dying all the time in unexpected deaths. And for you today to say no to God again, who knows that it's not your day? Well, I mean, we ought to at least for a moment take a serious consideration. Hey, I, I, I'm going to die. 
That, that's why, you know, in, 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 the, in the book of wisdom, it talks about how it's better in the book of Ecclesiastes. It says to attend a funeral than a party. Because at the funeral, at the event of death, we consider our lives. It's one thing I tell folks at every funeral I do. Hey, we're standing here over this body. One day we're going to be standing over yours. One day they're going to stand over mine. It's going to happen. And I would pray that in, in that moment that you step into eternity, you very clearly know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because that's your only hope. You, that, that you're not going to get to God and bargain a deal. You're not going to be able to say, oh, God, wait, hold, hold, hold on. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't rob any banks. I didn't have any affairs with women. I was faithful to my wife. The, the Bible says it's not by works. It's by grace. It's, it, you've, God has done everything for you to be saved through his son. Now you need to accept the gift. And you run that risk. And you keep procrastinating and putting God off. The third risk is the risk of your heart becoming hard. And this is a terrible tragedy because this happens. Satan is so quick to say when we start getting under conviction about our relationship with God, he is so quick to enter into the scenario of our thoughts and say something like this. Oh, yeah, that's all true, but there's no hurry. No rush. It's not time. Chill out. You can put this off. Next time. Unfortunately, next time you become harder. You become more easily confused. Hebrews 7 says, Hebrews 3.15 tells us there, hey, while I said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Hebrews 7 says, wherefore is the Holy Spirit says today, hear his voice. Hebrews 4, 7 says, God has limited a certain day. Today, after so long a time, it said, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Jesus said, when I leave, as he did, I'm going to send another one, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. He's me, but he's not me, but he is me. Because we're one and he's going to convict. If you read John chapter 16, it says he's going to convict the world. He's going to reprove the world, correct the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. He says of sin because they don't believe on me. What's the greatest sin? Not trusting God. That's the one that'll end you up in hell. Not trusting God. He said of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you don't see me anymore. In other words, when he was here, you understood what it meant to be right with God. You look at Jesus. So the Holy Spirit's going to convince you of what it means to be right with God and what righteousness is. He said, you'll, because you'll see me anyway. And he's going to convince you of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. In other words, the Holy Spirit has a ministry to our lives, even when we don't know God. And the Holy Spirit comes and convinces us that we need to know God, that we need to trust the Lord, that we need to give our hearts to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He speaks that to our heart. Uh, you know what? How many can say, I know what it's like to be under that kind of conviction? Raise your hand. You know what that's like? When the Holy Spirit comes and says, you need to get right with God. You need to get right with God. Man, I, I tell you, I don't know about you. I fought that. I fought that. I didn't want to get right with God. I want to be right with me. I want to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to give me the first place in my life. I wanted me to make the decisions. And so I fought it. But when he comes, every time he comes and speaks to us and we, we, we hesitate, what happens? A heart gets harder. Why? Well, look at that terminology on the screen. He says, don't harden your hearts as in the provocation. The provocation is in the context of what he's talking about here. When Israel kept refusing to let God be God. When he kept showing himself to them, when he kept delivering them, when he kept feeding them, when he kept clothing them, when he kept healing them, they'd go along for a few days and they'd go right back to where they were. And it says it was the provocation. It means they were provoking God. The word in the Hebrew language has to do with rubbing something in a raw place. You ever get some new shoes? Get a blister back there? And every time you put those shoes on, how much it hurt? That's it's provoking it. You ever done some kind of new labor or something with your hands and got blisters in a place you didn't have blisters before and all of a sudden every time you use them, it's just, you know, just irritating. You know, you put band-aids on, it doesn't help. It's provoking it. Why is God provoked? Think about that for a moment. Why would God be provoked? Because God bankrupt heaven on your behalf. God sent his son Jesus to die and become, not just die, but to become sin for you. To become the payment for my sin. Everything I have ever done, said, thought, lived out, acted upon that was wrong and unrighteous and ungodly and unholy. Jesus becomes that on the cross for me. No wonder the father would be provoked if I keep resisting that. When everything's been done for me. And I would choose my own will or my own word or my own way over what he had to say. 
The last of these risks, as your heart gets harder and harder, is the risk of losing your soul in hell. What will it profit a man? These are the words of Jesus. What's it going to profit you? If you get everything in the world, but you lose your soul. If you have all the friends, if you become the, if you're putting God off so you can be popular, what's that going to profit you when you lose your soul? If you're putting God off because you're involved in some business deals that you know aren't really godly, but it's making you a lot of money, what's that going to profit you if you lose your soul? If you gain the whole world, if you have the respect of the entire world, if you become the president of the world, what's it matter? This is just for a moment. This life is eternity is forever. If you lose your soul in hell, you've lost everything. There's no hope for you at that point. If you follow this story on, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart even after this. And if you follow it on, it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Another plague. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Another plague. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What happens? You cross the line. You entered into what we call tombstone territory. All right? You, you send away that day of grace. You said no too many times. You told God to leave you alone too many times. And now God says, okay. And it's all over. There's no hope. There's no chance. Why? Because I, just, I think I can live one more night with the frogs. The things that are causing my heartache, the things that are causing me pain, the things that are wrecking my life, my marriage, my home, my finances, whatever it might be, I choose to have things over God. One more night with the frogs. Maybe you've heard of the great Chicago fires of the 1800s. Some people thought the great Chicago fire of 1871 was started by Miss O'Leary's cow kicking over a lantern in the barn while being milked. Some people believe that a meteor struck in Chicago starting that tremendous fire. Before those fires began, there was a meeting going on. Many of you are familiar with the name D.L. Moody. We use some of his quotes a lot in scriptures and many preachers do. Had a great ministry of evangelism, revivalism. He was in Chicago. He launched a series of meetings in Chicago that promised the largest crowds of people attending a religious event at any time in history. Thousands of people would come to hear Moody preach. He was speaking on the life of Christ in the night of this meeting, Sunday night, October 8th, 1871. And he was talking there about that night about the trial of Jesus as he stood before Pilate in the Sanhedrin. He came to the end of his message in, in Matthew 27, and it says this, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? You remember the quote, you know, the, the question that po Pilate poses to the Sanhedrin? What will I do with Christ? Yeah, it might have been some kind of um, artistic device, but speaking in later years, D.L. Moody says it's one of the greatest mistakes he'd ever done. Because what he did when he finished the message, at the end of his message, he said, here's what I'd like you to do instead of giving an invitation, which you normally would do. I wish that you would just take this text home, Matthew 27, 22, turn it over in your minds during the week, and at our next Sunday gathering, we will come to Calvary and to the cross, and we'll make a decision on what we're going to do with Jesus of Nazareth. It was later in his life, he said, that had to be one of the greatest mistakes I've made in my ministry. His worship leader was named Iris Sankey. He's written some great hymns. And he began to sing an invitational hymn without giving an invitation just to close the service. And the song, of the, the, the hymn went something like this. Today the Savior calls for a refuge you fly. The storm of justice falls and death is nigh. The fire engines at the end of that service begin to sound on the streets on their way. As they're making first contact with the Chicago fires. The hall was dismissed. That hall later on laid in ashes. It was estimated that in Chicago that night, close to a thousand people lost their lives. They said a hundred thousand people were left homeless. 17,000 structures were destroyed and damaged, was estimated in 1870 at $200 million. Imagine what those numbers would be today in the billions from this one fire, the great Chicago fire. Moody said, I never saw that congregation again. And some of those people that I spoke to that night, no doubt died in that fire.
All Pharaoh had to do was ask Moses to say, today, have them removed. But it's tomorrow. Maybe I can be content one more day with this because I just don't want to submit to God. That's what it really comes down to. Maybe if I wait, it'll just go away. It'll just deal with itself. Maybe somehow in the night tonight, they're just going to simply leave the land and these things are going to disappear. That, that is so human of us, isn't it? I don't want God to be in charge. So somehow this will work out. We're just content to wade through the frogs of disobedience and sin in our lives. Wade through the plague and the wake of shame and filth that it leaves in our life. Can it be better than living with God? Than live with the frogs? So you put off tomorrow. We'll start to read my Bible. Start tomorrow being more involved in church. I'll start tomorrow sharing my faith. I'll start tomorrow praying. I'll start tomorrow just happy with our little meager spiritual existence. This is not the way God designed it. Let me ask you this. Are you personally tired of the frogs? I mean, just, and God would say to you, hey, all right, you ready to go? Let's go. Let's move forward. Let's make a decision. Let's do it today. Let's do what's right. Let's, let, let's make the commitment. Let's lay aside the sin. Let's get right with God. Let's get our hearts in tune. Today is the day of salvation. No more nights. The frogs. Let's get it resolved. I, I can't tell you how many meetings and revivals and church services that we've done. 40 plus years of ministry. How many people have gone on into eternity that I've preached to. They kept saying one more night with the frogs. Young people, adults, kids. Fully aware of what they need to do. Uh, not today though. I got plans. I want to do this my way. And everybody else is doing it, so it must be all right. It must be all right because this is the way I see it, the way I want to do it. Just think back with me over this last week. How many of you saw the countless pictures of cars piled up in high, heaping water? Somebody drove up to that water and says, it's okay. In my mind, I've calculated I can do this. It must be right because I'm saying it's right. It must work because I'm going to do it. So it's, yeah, I'm, here I go. Swimming out of the cars, those that could and some couldn't. But it looked right to me. I was in a big hurry. I got things to do. I got plans. I need to get through. Looked right. Wasn't so right. How about you today? Are you rationalizing and trying to reason things that you know are not rational and reasonable with God? We're going to give an invitation today, so I'd ask you to stand with me. We won't put this off to tomorrow or next Sunday.